This is Alexandra from Perced. And this is Paul from the Time Repair Corporation. And we both welcome you to the monthly Interchange podcast. A meeting of the minds, people reaching outside of themselves in an attempt to reach a deeper understanding of perspectives. And it is through this coming together of perspectives that we hope to serve the divergence, the polymaths, the people who don't fit into molds, the people we like to call angels of chaos. In short, those who do not belong in a single unique environment. And we want to achieve that by inviting these troublemakers from around the world and really digging into their experiences and unique views, the things that have made them, them. And it is these views, these things that have made them who they are, that we like to share uh, today and every month with you. And we like to support them with models, models that can support personal development, models that can support sustainability, models that, they can, that can support global and human flourishment. But there is something else that is very important about the Interchange podcast. And that is that we want to grow that conversation. We want to reach out and involve more people so that this really and truly becomes a borderless interchange. All right, and today we have a, I, I, cannot, I cannot properly express how I feel about this guest. I've known her for a few years now, and every time I see her, she has brought joy into my life, and this is just what she does with everyone who I know who has met her. She is effectively an agent of compassion and an advocate for kindness, and someone who has taken an incredible journey in order to become the chocolate angel. So today I'd like to introduce you all to Verena Rintrop, a dear friend and someone who I am overjoyed to have on Interchange today. Verena, welcome. Thanks so much, Paul and Alexandra. It's my absolute pleasure to meet both of you and to be par become part of this Interchange conversation with you. Nothing more is a pleasure to me today. And on this note, I'd like to jump right into our questions. So, first question. You are described by many people to be a woman of many talents. Would you tell us a little bit about yourself, all of the different sort of roles that you've played over the years, the experiences that you've nurtured yourself with? Uh, how much time do I have, Paul, for this answer? <laughs> right. 24 hours. Okay, excellent, excellent. We, we might need that. Let, let me... <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I'm, uh, right, um, what can I say? Um, I have a long journey behind me, right, uh, a journey which, surprisingly, I still remember more or less every single step along the way. And um, there are certain things which I never did, for example, which might be surprising for some. I never, ever went to university right, that kind of, I happily skipped over that step, not necessarily voluntarily, but I feel that it was not a bad thing that I never went there. So in a way, I went to the University of Life, right. Um, by trade, I never, or only a few years ago, I learned what is the proper English term for my real trade, the original trade I learned. And by trade, I'm a forwarding agent. Uh, in German, it's called Speditionskauffrau, uh, right? Because I'm a woman, so I obviously use the female reference, not the male one. Uh, and that means um, I learned how to deal with trucks and logistics and kind of keeping, keeping cargo moving around the world. So, right, I, I still remember, for example, one question for my final exam, and that was, please write um, no one trucking capable uh, kind of highway to every neighbor country of Germany. 
So at the time, right between uh, you know uh, West uh, Germany, and it was still at the time Western Germany or uh, BDR, uh, BRD, and uh, DDR. So right, it was one to DDR, it was one to Denmark, one to Austria, one to France, etc. Um, but then I, for example, um, also worked a while in our family business. So twice, once I worked there as a, as a quality engineer. So I would really kind of measure drilled metal parts on a very high precision. What else have I done in my life? Um, I worked also in, a, in a, a moving company, right? If you would have lived around Frankfurt at some point in my life, Right, and you wanted to move, for example, from Frankfurt to, I don't know, Helsinki, or perhaps we wouldn't have done Helsinki, but right, usually with a truck. And then I would be in the office kind of organizing that, right, the truckers would come pack your stuff and then move all your belongings to another part of the city or the, the country. Um, what else? Um, there was an interesting time when I started uh, ending up working for Nokia. And there, for example, I started with between uh, purchasing department, logistics. And for 15 years, I ended up working in IT because I was so interested in, you know, how IT systems works and all those interconnected elements in an IT system. Right, you put information somewhere on the left side into an IT system, right, as a user. And then let's say 30 dots later, right, a completely wrong information comes out from the other side. So that's how I ended up uh, kind of uh, working in IT. I uh, became, after many years, right, a global process manager, even though I really hate processes. Or let's say I hate. No, sorry, I don't hate processes as such. I hate swim lanes. Do you know those kind of, right? If you want to document a process, it's like step here, yes, no, step there, etc. I can't draw them. But I'm really good, for example, if someone shows me a process diagram, I can say, but wait a second, something is not quite right here. Why that is going there? So I'm really good criticizing it, but I'm really bad in drawing it. Um, and at least currently, because one of, I think my superpower is really, I, I connect people, right? I work with people all over the world. And I'm also good in speaking, not just uh, kind of perhaps potentially English these days, right? But I'm also good in, for example, speaking business and IT. Not sure if you know, but business and IT are really speaking different languages. They might think they speak the same language, but sorry, I have to say they don't. So I have a really good later between this and so these days I work as a deployment manager and there I need to constantly translate between business and IT. And in between, right, I'm running my own company as a chocolate angel. <laughs> where my superpower is to make everyone smile anywhere in every part of the world, in any part of the world. That's I would say that is a kind of, right? It's a great it's a shift. Answer. It's a fantastic shift. Uh, but I, I'm not sure if it's a shift because it's like a kind of a wandering through a variety of different experiences that led you eventually to the discovery of something that shows who you are deep inside as a person. So perhaps the question that makes sense now is how did you manage that shift from being an IT slash business whisperer uh, and processes creator and quality engineer and, and all of that? How did you transfer yourself, your identity, your energy, your power, your superpowers from that area to this area, your own business, uh, your, your chocolate age old business? How did that happen? Yes. Um, I mean, it, it's, uh, let's say, an, an interesting side. Let me first start with a side note, and then I go into the answer of the question. Because the fun thing, what I just kind of recently remembered back was that 
right? I told you I, uh, I by trade, I'm a forwarding agent and I, within I think half a year, I moved into the, into the uh, kind of food delivering part of the business. So we had customers like Barilla and a brand called Brand. I'm not sure if you're aware of Brand, but they are, for example, this very hard bread, what you can pretty much write, you give a child so in, in, in milk so that they, their teas kind of come out, right? And they are also in the business of making chocolate. So for example, right, they are producing um, seasoned chocolate. So, right, I had to deal in my very first uh, job, right, and that is long, long time ago, with seasonal chocolate. So I had to deal, yeah. deal with kind of smiling uh, Easter bunny out of chocolate. And, uh, you know, I, there's a fun story where I was um, need to kind of direct three huge trucks full of chocolate, right, to the city, to go to the customs office where they had to declare the chocolate which was imported into Germany. So that was a fun. So th keep that in mind, right? Later I had nothing to do with chocolate. But um, my first 15 years I were in Nokia, I worked in Germany and traveled quite often to Finland. And every one day, right, you go to duty free and then I uh, saw there are some boxes of chocolate, right, and I would buy the chocolate, right, and then uh, when I next morning, right, would uh, then go into the Nokia IT headquarter, which was on the current main Nokia kind of campus here in Espoo, and I would start walking around the office. Right, we had already open office concepts, so there were about, I don't know, on one uh, floor, there were about 60 to 80 desks. And because I had at the time already a global role, and a lot of people I worked with were based in Espo, so even I might have not known them in person, but I exchanged email with them or chat or whatsoever. So I would in the morning before my real work started, I would take that box and walk around the whole office, the whole space. And I would walk, go to every single desk, right? And with a smile, I opened the box and offered it to the person. But this interesting thing is because people sometimes ask me, oh, so did you copy it from somewhere? Oh, that sounds so the US based, right? Paul, <laughs> is anyone in the US doing that? Not generally. It's, it's a rare thing to find somebody just offering something for free anywhere in the U.S., let alone with some kindness. <laughs> and so I, I, there's really no kind of, there's no model for that. I did not have someone, I didn't saw it somewhere. It was just one day I did that, right? I mean, um, and then because it, it becomes a pattern. Right, so every trip I was flying to Finland, right, same habit. And I can even tell you exactly the brand and the box and everything what it was, right? It was uh, from, from uh, Lind. It was, there, there's later an interesting connection uh, um, for, you know, why it became later really important because I'm a detail oriented German, right? So everything in a way <laughs> goes down to the details. And it was like a, a box about that size. It was not the usual Lind product. And uh, when you open it, it had four um, kind of compartments. And in each compartment, in one, there was like hazelnut covered in chocolate, right? The next one was almonds covered in chocolate. Mm -hmm. The next one was kind of, I don't know what, what was the third one. And then there was one without nuts, just with a bit of a kind of cookie inside the chocolate, right? So it had about, I don't know, 60 to 80 kind of pieces, right? And so every time I traveled to Finland, same walking through duty free, buying about three of those boxes while doing the same next time. Um, and then it, it really, because the, I'm not saying I got kind of addicted to this kind of moment, but it became really, really a nice kind of moment back. And for example, surprisingly, not really understanding it myself, but I never did it when traveling back. 
So in Germany, in the office, I, I wouldn't do that. But at the same time, what I did uh, was that a friend of mine, right, who was sitting in the office next to me, he worked in the Works Council and they loved Fazza chocolate. So they said, okay, Verena, please, are you traveling to Finland again? Yes. Can you please bring back, and then I brought them about five, six, seven bars of Fazza chocolate, right, the, the big bars, right? They paid me because, right, it's Works Council, right, there should be no inappropriety, so they paid for it. But so it, it really kind of became a pattern over the years. And uh, sorry, I, I'm still kind of right going forth and back, but Alexandra, that, does that already give you the right idea of how that ended yeah. up in my, uh, my kind of real job later? <laughs> it makes, it started making sense when you said you had your first encounter with chocolate and the experiences that we have in life kind of shape us. And sometimes we have these kind of small hints that uh, these kind of small dots that we successfully connect by looking backwards and stealing a Steve Jobs uh, quote here. Um, and, and it's true. And we have these kind of small moments that eventually lead up to what we consider as a defining characteristic or a pattern that really kind of is, is a trait for that, that presents us, that expresses who we are as individuals and so on and so forth. But I love to hear also the next part, which is after all this chocolate from Finland to Germany, back and forth, sometimes back to Germany, but more often in Finland. And then how did things evolve from yes. then on? Yes. Um, I mean, um, brief, let's say in, in 2011, certain things happened, especially in the context of Nokia and uh, not just uh, impacting me, but many people around the world. And uh, kind of we can talk about that later, but things ended up that... I got uh, as a kind of exceptional situation offered to move to Finland and continue working for Nokia in Finland. And um, the, the trigger, right, uh, of traveling went away, but I started to really miss this kind of effect. And then I was suddenly pretty much within months in the headquarter of Nokia, right? I mean, I never worked in the headquarter of anything. So what I did was I would, for example, ask someone, are you traveling? Can you bring me, for example, those, there are those huge buckets of top, mini Toblerone, right? There were about 120 mini Toblerone in one bucket. So I said, bring them to me, right? Or, um, so I would kind of constantly buy things, right? In my supermarket, the, the, the kind of uh, candy bag was kind of crumbled, so they would sell it to a cheaper price. I was like, okay, buy it, right? And so I would start really on a regular basis, walk around Nokia house. And I would do that, right, if I was stressed. For example, it's, I, I never realized, but it's, it's an amazing kind of way, right, to balance your stress at work. And there is one story where, which is, which has a sad component, but which was extremely powerful for me to really, right, use that method to really get over a grief situation, which I was so not prepared on a working day. And that already happened not in Nokia, but uh, later years uh, when I was kind of in that work environment, which then finally threw me into leaving the corporate world and really starting my own business. And that was because, right, I remember pretty much everyone I've ever worked with. So, um, and one dear ex-colleague from Germany, he knows I am the caring person. So whenever he knew that someone, I knew an ex-colleague passed away, he would send me an email. Um, how he did it was kind of, he, the email subject sometimes is really important, right? And he would put in the email subject just the name of the person. So in a way, right, getting such an email from him means, I know what it means. It means that person passed away. And it was a person which had a very kind of relevance for me because I'm also one of my side tracks is I'm a photo artist. 
And at a time when I was so not willing to call myself a photo artist, right? Many years back, she um, uh, uh, she uh, was uh, what she was a teacher at a university for you know people who organize art uh, kind of um, art events, right? And she said, "Please, I want your my students to organize an exhibition for you." And I said, "No, no, 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 no. I'm, I'm not an artist. I don't want to do that." But she was the first person who paid me money for one of my um, photos. And so she passed away. And that completely threw me off, right? I, one second, right, I dealt with IT processes and the next second I knew she passed away. And that pretty much immediately kind of put me in distress. And at the time I was an external consultant, so I got paid by the hour. What I did, I pretty much locked myself out of the payment system. So for the next, I think, one and a half to two hours, I would not be getting paid from the company for what I did. What I did, I took my box full of chocolate and candies I had next to my desk, and I walked through the whole office, right, for as long as it took me to balance myself emotionally so that I was able after that time to say, okay, now it's time that you pay me again, right, and I could just continue just to work on my day. That's so extremely, it's, it's just even right. Yeah. No, that's extremely, extremely important. And I think that you've, you've hit on something that I've experienced in my own life and probably part of why, part of why I was so happy to, to meet you and connect with you, not just the first time, but every time I've run into you over the years now in Helsinki. Um, and that is that as I myself have had a similar, similar sort of functional pattern in which I don't necessarily, I don't necessarily look inside or, or deal with everything that I'm feeling myself, but I am always sort of eager, especially when I'm in uh, an office situation in a corporate setting, I've always felt like it was sort of a responsibility to go around and talk to people, see how they're doing. And this, this was something that kind of lent itself for a while. It was, it was IT support. So, you know, if I went out to, you know, help somebody with their email or remind them that the CD drive was not a cup holder or any of these other horror stories you hear about, and then, then you realize that someone has actually found a way to make them true. And it's like, this is supposed to be an urban legend. Anyway, um, but when you were walking back, when you would go through an office, I would usually do my best to take my time and make sure that I had checked in with everybody in that office and just taken a moment to listen to whatever it was that was bothering them. Because that was, that was what sort of set me apart in IT was that I wasn't hired because of technical skills. I was hired because I could talk to people and... And this is a rare thing among IT and engineering types. Usually we're very focused on the problem and the technology. And that's, I, I understand that too. That's just sort of where my brain works. But for me, talking to people was about, to a degree, processing my own, my own grief and pain. And I think that people don't tend to see that. People tend to see the smile. They tend to hear the you know, the uplifting message, they, they tend to be happy that someone's listening for just a moment. That little micro moment. It's, Yeah, yeah, it's, it's the, the, the attention. It's like, and uh, I mean, I, I love that because that also very much connects right to my own story. Because, right, I mean, I told you, I, I'm, I was such more on the, the business side, right? Yeah. And IT people are living, I mean, I... I think everyone who has the, or who takes the brave step, right, to cross that side, right, to cross from the business side or from wherever they come, right, yeah. or perhaps their private interest in, in, you know, setting up a cool computer, right, and have gaming, to really enter the IT world, because IT needs those kind of 
coming from the side people, right? Who kind of think outside. It's not important just, hey, can I have the latest technology? No, what business really need is not the latest technology server, right? They need a functioning system. Mm -hmm. Well, I remember that, uh, um, right, uh, for example, uh, to, to explain IT people, right, there are real life consequences of what they do. Yeah. And I remember, for example, if, um, right, uh, right, I mean, part of my last really kind of uh, job in the corporate world before I then really stepped out and start my own business was for seven years, I was the global process manager for a beautiful process called incident management. And <laughs> yeah, I thought uh, Paul with his IT background might know what I'm talking about. So, um, I mean, I was able to really bring something positive in the world of incident management. And Alexander, for you, if incident process is all about, right, your laptop suddenly doesn't work anymore or any system, right? You uh, sent an email, right, and it's not going out. All Makes of sense. those are incidents, right? Whether the server is going down or whatever. So for example, the usual example I would take to really, you know, if someone is like, okay, hey, my shift is over, right? I don't care that the server just went down, let's say two minutes ago, the next one can take care of it, right? And to that person, I would say, okay, and let's say your way home, right? You need to take the bus. And here in Helsinki, as full right, we have beautifully on all the bus stations, right, a little display where you can see the next bus is coming two minutes or in five minutes or 10 minutes. Imagine that system is running on the server you just left un kind of monitored and you did not fix it. And the next moment you stand there, what the, am I allowed to swear on this podcast? <laughs> so what the, hey, whatever, right? Why is that not working? Because you two minutes ago, right, had it so, was so in a hurry and the server was down. And still, when it comes to this kind of interacting and speaking with people, because, um, right, I mean, I, I never even, re or it was really, again, it was one of those things which rather, it, it was how I was, but I never really were able to connect those dots. Because over the years in the corporate world, people would tell me things, very private things, where I was like, uh, uh, who am I? I mean, how come you're telling me that, right? Years later, now I understand because I gave them positive attention, right? I, I was really there. I was interested in the person. And also the thing with Paul, when you said, right, you were not paid to really talk with them. There's an interesting kind of connecting again, the pieces because um, the first time that I was really amazed that a person would open up to me and we are now traveling back in time from 2021 to 1998. Nice. Um, and um, I was a logistic coordinator, so I dealt with invoices. And, and by the way, I never applied for a job in Nokia because I did not know what the word invoice mean. I knew Rechnung, but I had no idea what an invoice is or what an order confirmation is. So uh, we, we were trained, it was a social skills training and I'm not even sure anymore which training it was, but I think it was, uh, wait, let me think about it, what I remember. I, I mean, I could dig it out, but oh yeah, it was, I think about time management, mm. right? So it was even, I think the two days training about it, right? And then um, at some point the trainer said, Verena, you are not paid, uh, you have a helping hand syndrome and you're not paid for that. Helping hand syndrome. Same, yes. Fantastic. And at the same, <laughs> and at the same time, uh, one of the exercises was there, right? They grouped two people together to kind of have this short, you know, you tell the other person a couple of things about yourself and then you introduce the other person front of everyone, right? 
So I was sitting with a person I've never met before, right? I told him things about me, right? And one of the first things uh, he said was, and I'm gay. And I'm like, uh, oh, okay. Um, so do you expect me, right, to introduce that information about you to everyone? And she was like, he was, no, no, no. I'm like, oh, okay, good to know. But it was really, I'm like, in a way, a bit blown away by that fact, because I mean, right, the, the exercise was to tell me things so that I can introduce you to 20 other people. And I mean, I, I'm not sure if it was his coming out, but it was just in looking back, it was in, I think it was because I was just listening. I was really interested in him as a person. People kind of feel this bond of trust when it is established. Uh, it, when you're talking to a person and this person is actively listening and you know that whatever it is that you're going to say, they're not just going to listen, but they're going to take it with openness and with appreciation and with respect uh, without ever judging you. That creates this kind of bridge of trust and people mm -hmm. would be sharing a lot more with you than they would with any random person whose natural reaction would be judgmental or perhaps even worse than judgment, indifference. Mm, true. So it makes sense in a way and it, it can easily also be connected since we're connecting dots here all the time. Um, <laughs> since, since we're connecting the dots, it can easily be connected also to this, uh, the, the human side of chocolate angel, which is much more than chocolate. Chocolate is as, it's an excuse to connect, yes. it's an excuse to converse, it's an yeah. excuse to smile and create the smile. Um, and and it's, it establishes this connection instead of it being that of trust between two individuals. It's a, another type of bridge between two individuals who instead of gathering over a cup of coffee or yeah. whatever, yeah. or what else, um, they're kind of connecting over exactly yes, or water or whatever it is there is inside yeah. i have no idea no, no. Um, <laughs> so um so yeah I, for me it makes it makes total sense um but i would love also to come back to the story when this kind of obsession with connecting people over chocolate transformed into an actual business yes so a lot of times we fail to channel our inner child, our interests, our uh, passions, our obsessions to something that can actually make our life, make our professional experiences. So how did that happen with you? The, the, the switch really from taking that very human behavior from the IT world. Um, I was working in, uh, as an external consultant at that time in my life where um, I was involved in a huge change program where they really try to change uh, the whole process landscape within IT. So every process was uh, turned over a lot of kind of uh, organizational changes. The whole organization was in a way up in the air and, um, and with the processes often in IT comes also the world of uh, new systems, right? Mm -hmm. And um, I was kind of, what I saw was that um, I did not really felt good that, because management often thinks, oh, it's just a new process. It's just a change, right? Guys, get used to it, right? Just live it, right? But that's not how it works, right? So for me, it's you need to take the people with you. You need to give them a bigger picture and not just telling, okay, instead of this step, you do now this step. Right? You need to take the human being with you. Otherwise, as a management, you wake up, you might wake up two years later and wonder why that report is still happening. Didn't we change that and stop that two years ago? And then was like, then they realized the change did not drop all the way down to the person who really need to live the change. Otherwise, it will not be bringing the benefit you want. So I was an external consultant and let's say whoever checks me out later will not find the company I'm talking about because there's no reference whatsoever in my LinkedIn profile. Because right, I talk here quite openly. So 
it's no none on no one's business right who that company was but i brought already my habit of bringing chocolate to everyone by the way i did it only once a week because if it's too often then it becomes a bit of a pavlov dog right exercise mm -hmm. so i would do it only once a week and that's where i started to really observe kind of the reaction of people right and that was really it, it was in a way uh, the start of me being blown my mind by what, what people really perceived when they met me, right? There were reactions when people said, oh, I'm really sorry, I can't take it, right? Diabetes, whatever it was, but please don't stop offering it to me. And I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> there, there was one, I mean, um, there was one person, right, and uh, I once really kind of gave him a special kind of attention and a special chocolate, right, it was a handmade praline, because I really wanted to say thank you to a certain people who really helped me to blow my mind and change my whole life. And he is really, I mean, he's like <clears throat> full of muscles. He, he was, I saw him at six o'clock in the morning in the gym, right, uh, connected to the office. And he always looked really, really angry, right? And there was only, right, once a week, right, when I turned around with my box, I got within a millisecond the most beautiful smile from him. And when I gave him that special proline, I asked him a bit more about him, right? And he told me he's, he has, I think, five or six kids, right? He hates his job from deep down in his guts but he needs the money, right? And he was working, I don't know, 60 hours, more than 60 hours every week, right? But he needed the money to keep his family afloat, right? And so it, it was even so far that, uh, right? Because it became such a habit. So if I go to an event or right, I was still doing it just as a nice habit, right? I would go to here to pick up a parcel, right? Or in the supermarket and I would offer it to the, to the one who just, got money for me, right? And so I went to an event and I did the usual thing, right? I would approach everyone, right? And um, someone who was uh, kind of, who knew my habit from that environment where I was just an external consultant, right? And she went there and she saw everywhere empty uh, chocolate wrapper, but different type. And she was like, every food was already gone. And she was like, oh, come on, guys, I'm hungry. At least, where is the chocolate? I need anything to eat. And the people were like, oh, no, no, they were not from us, right? There was this strange woman walking around, offering everyone chocolate. And she was like, oh, my goodness, the chocolate angel was here. So when she met me the next time, she was like, you know what, Verena? You made a brand out of what you were doing, right? People know the chocolate angel was there. And that, I think, was one of the trigger where I really started putting it in LinkedIn, but that was still not before I started my company. Starting my company, let me still expand that a bit more because, right, I mean, there are so many dots to be connected in my life. Because, I mean, that was obviously not my plan, right? I, I'm, I'm a very, very, you know, down-to-earth business person, right? So I was obviously looking for a job. And... I don't, even though I'm now living uh, over nine years in Finland, right, my 10th year, in my 10th year, but I still don't speak Finnish. And right, I'm now already over 50. I'm a woman who barely ever stopped talking. So it's definitely not easy to find a job here. So um, I was, you know, applying uh, in different companies. And the fun fact is that in the beginning of 20, end of 2015, beginning of 2016, I was applying and got twice in an interview with a company I work now for. And for a job which was, it's closely connected to what I do now. But at the time, it was different people, different, right? It was all about really a big change management program starting. And they were like, yeah, yeah, you, yeah, you, you're really different, right? But yeah, we might, right, consider you. And then one day I had lunch with someone, right? I was still in my external consultant job. 
And then I got an email. In that email, the, uh, the hiring manager informed me, you know, sorry, but the position is put on hold. Right, if it's reopened, then we will come back to you. And in that second, I was like, fuck off corporate world. I will start my own business as Chocolate Angel. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> How much cheering did you get at that time? I mean, you know, you mean from the, from the one who was sitting opposite to me? But for instance, your, your, your family, your close ones, your friends, <laughs> like, yes, yes, Verena, that's the right thing to do. <laughs> Are you kidding me? I yes, mean... I am. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, my, my, my family were like, oh, my goodness. I mean, right, uh, what I should tell perhaps here also at this point, right, I have never built a family of my own. So, I mean, I, I have no, uh, I usually, right, I'm, I'm, I have a lot of kids in my life, right? But none of my own. I love kids over everything, but I don't think I would be a good mom. So, and uh, I also, I usually, and, and sorry, Paul, but I usually say, I also don't have an idiot sitting on my sofa. Um, no, <laughs> no offense taken. <laughs> this is, okay. honestly, if more men could view themselves this way, I think the world would run a little more smoothly. <laughs> we, we just, we gotta, we gotta, we got to take the punches that are uh, on target. Right? Um, yes. And, and the best thing is that when I told that first time to my mom, she was laughing out loud. So I think she really, really liked that. <laughs> Even though there were times when they were hoping that, right, I would build a family. But I'm, I have to say, thanks to my older brother, I have two brothers. One is older, one is younger, because my older brother gave my parents two grandsons. So the, I, I think otherwise there would have been far more pressure on me, mm. right, to produce an heir, right, to, to bring the, next, uh, the business into the next generation, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, sorry, you need to get me back <laughs> from that kind of sidetrack. But yeah, reactions from family and, and friends. So, I mean, they, they kind of, um, my, my oldest friend I told earlier about, right, um, they visited me here, right, their, their daughter is my dearest, so when she was born, right, her father called me and said, you are now an aunt. So I'm pretty much building my extended family all the time, right, I have two adopted, two adopted sons, right, just last week, right, my first adopted son accepted my, my third uh, child, adopted child, so my adopted daughter. And I have, right, three uh, adopted grandkids through my first adopted son. And I got adopted from, an, uh, from someone as their little sister. Mm -hmm. So, but um, back to, to that part of my family. So my oldest friend, her husband and the daughter love to visit me here in Helsinki, right? And they had seen that reaction. So I was here at a design market, right? And they saw what happened in people's eyes when I do that. So my parents saw them when I was at the wedding of my younger brother, right? They were invited. We were all in the middle of the countryside in Germany and my parents were extremely worried. So they, but they didn't express that, that uh, in intensity to me. So they spoke with them and they were like, what is Verena doing? I mean, she has well paid job. I mean, she, she's earning good money. So how can she do that? Well, what, what? <laughs> I mean, I was not there. So I can just imagine the conversation they had. And my friends, my parents, we have seen the magic working. We know this will work. Mm. And um, I mean, I, I have to say, right, I, I don't think I'm... I'm Right, uh, as you might have already noticed, right, I've never planned anything in my life, right? I mean, I was not planning to become a forwarding agent, right? That happened through some things, right? I never planned to work for Nokia. I was even, right, I never even applied for a job in Nokia. I was a temp worker, right? I didn't understand the language they spoke there. So I was, but, but when I, pretty much decided that, right? That was, I, I don't know, something clicked in me, right? 
So I immediately started, right? I, I, it was clear from the beginning I, that will be a business, mm. right? And in a way, I knew from the beginning the service is really right on an hourly basis, right? People can book me, I come and I do what I do, right? I even knew the extended services, right? I offer as well, but I think at the heart of it, it's really only about really spreading those micro moments of love. Um, and I mean, I, I, because I was a really, really serious workaholic, right? I, I just couldn't stop working, right? I, when, I, when I started working, I was like, oh, my passion, right? I can work and I, because I, I tend to see everything, everywhere I look, right? I open every door, I see all the crap, right? I, I open, right, something was like, hmm, there's a failure, there's not working. By the way, that communication is not reaching the right people. Right, that is part of my superpower. Um, this so, is very IT. <laughs> <laughs> but, but Paul, the interesting thing is, I usually say, right, looking back at my 15 years in, or no, in total it was 17 years in Nokia and Microsoft, um, I often say that, right, you see my nose, it's pretty kind of broken, right? You can see my nose was broken about 15 to 17 times. No, not literally, not, not literally. Okay. But, right, if you're a business person with a happy mindset, right, and you constantly find everywhere you look the things which are not working, right, people might want to say, Verena, shut up. You yeah. really don't want to hear what you have to say. Right. Yeah. And, and I just wouldn't give up. Right. I, I would go left and right and right. If the first try didn't work, right, then I would kind of try it another way. I would try it another way. Right. And if they would still not listen, I might embarrass them in front of the audience of 100 people. So like, <laughs> excuse me. Right. I, I don't think you're inviting the right people to this kind of session. And I think that at least when I moved to Finland and continue working for Nokia and then also Microsoft, right, that exposed me then even more, right? And I was always a bit of a kind of, right, going to everyone, right, in, involving, talking with everyone. And I think, I, I, I think not necessarily everyone can deal with that person, right? I had different managers, some can let me go comfortably. Mm -hmm. And some of them really, really struggle with this one. And they were absolutely, they were like, what can, what can I do with that kind of energy buzzing, always talking kind of, ah, <laughs> how, how can I get you under control? Yeah. You can't. Um, and they just have to accept that. Yes. But I, uh, Paul, I, I might kind of go again down, right? You have an idea what is now coming, right? Yeah. Um, I have to say, I can see there a bit of pattern between the different managers who can mm. deal with me and managers who were absolutely incapable of managing me. Yeah. And that might have something to do with the gender, that might have something to do with the age, and that might have something to do with their profession. This... Can you dig a bit deeper into that? <laughs> yeah, it should be stated explicitly, if at all possible, so that everyone yes. can learn from this. Okay. Um, I mean, let, let, let's start with a bold statement. I think uh, typically male, um, middle age, right, 35 upwards kind of... Um, middle manager of type of engineer. I think there, I've so far met only one, no, sorry, I have to correct myself, two persons in the role of being my manager who were able to let me go and not interfere or kind of having worse consequences on me. And sometimes they might have not even get it. They, they, they usually don't even get what the consequences are, right? And I'm not saying um, that they are not good person and they don't want to give their best. Mm -hmm. But I also remember that, for example, I don't know about other companies, but in Nokia, they, they struggled a bit to really kind of what kind of 
career paths do you give an engineer? Yeah. Right. Hey, make them line manager. And I would say there are line managers who are really, or people who are not, perhaps never want to be a line manager and they are not necessarily people oriented, but they really get their stuck in a row and become amazing line manager. And then you have people who really, really can break other people by not getting what it means to be a line manager. Um, and then I had amazing, amazing women who were my line manager and uh, who just kind of I mean, I remember one of them, right? If I got something, I was like interested in some like, where is that data coming from and how is this all connected, etc. And then she just gave me a name and, and she knew pretty much, right? I would just reach out to that person, have a conversation with that person and come back with perhaps 10 new ideas and connections and, and kind of, so I, it was not even that I did it for my own sake, right? but really kind of, they always knew I came back with the most amazing kind of connection where perhaps the whole organization would kind of benefit from. Yeah. And that's- Was that concrete enough for you? <laughs> that's a beautiful answer. And, and honestly, this is from the purely engineering standpoint, looking at different people and stopping assessing this, this good and bad just, just black and white thinking, it, it's, it's a terrible limiting factor. But I think that a lot, of, a lot of men fall into this trap. As they get older, especially, they, they either have time for it, in which it is good, or it's something that takes up too much of their time and they don't know how to deal with it. And so they don't stop to think about it. They don't look at the why. They just put it in this bad category. And, and when you have a force of nature, when you have something that cannot be stopped, you should be looking at its properties. You should be assessing completely, completely with yourself out of the equation. Maybe I'm not good with this, but you know what? I should look and see the interactions. What happens when, when this person comes into an environment and does exactly what they do? Is it something that solves problems or brings in resources, fantastic. That's what we need to be focused on. And, and this is why I wanted you to be more explicit about it because honestly, it, it's not about me. It's not about my gender. It's about giving people the feedback that they need so that they can get right. And, yeah. and there are too many, um, too many men who kind of get lazy. Quite, quite honestly, I and, think that's and, I mean, part of it. It's just... Yeah. And, and because, right, I mean, you know, and for me, it's really, I mean, I, I will everyone who I've ever met in my life in a way, and I will still meet in my life, and they are most probably another hundred thousand or so, right, uh, ahead of me. But um, so for me, it's, um, I have seen it on, on both gender sides, right? But yeah. I have seen it at least in my in my own kind of along the way, right? I've seen it more on the male side, right? Yeah. But I've seen also really bad examples on the other side, right? For for female who really really kind of right are, are not good in this, or 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 where it's just kind of struggling because I think that. Um, part of, right, I mean, we so far have not quite exactly touched on my ADHD, but I think whoever listening and just get a, a few seconds of my energy, right, might have an idea that there is some kind of underlying uh, kind of, I don't know, how do we call it, right? I, I, it's, it's, not, it's, uh, it's not kind of a... Um, a Neurodivergence. It's, it's, it's a divergence. It's, it's kind of, if, if you embrace it, it can be something beautiful, right? And it can be also really burdensome if you don't know how to deal with it. Yeah. But um, now I just need to quickly connect my, 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 my red uh, line, which just get about kind of screwed up to, to go back to the point. Um, but so, yeah, I, I saw it on both sides, but I think, right, the, the ability to kind of really step back and, and see the, the beauty and the, the benefit of such a person, right? Yeah. And for example, um, 
it, it took me, even though I had an inkling that I am, might be an ADHD already when I was about 16, 17 years old, but nothing ever happened with that piece of information pretty much for my whole life, right? So, but at the same time, that means I have about 35, 36 years reflection on the fact that I might have ADHD, right? And so, for example, in right um, part of my kind of career if you call it that way was that I worked in a moving company and that was pretty much just I wanted a student job because I tried to be uh, at an online university to study which was a completely failure but I ended up working as a student in that moving company and there were two hiring manager it was a small company right two male right both, I would say, falling into that category, perhaps not engineer, but male and middle age. And one of them was against hiring me. And the other one, he, and I know that only by, by, so I was not in the conversation, obviously, right? But the other one told him like, but can't you see the passion in her eyes? We have to hire her. And he convinced the other one to hire me. Mm -hmm. Right, so it, it's really, so that is even right, where you have pretty much two people who on a day-to-day -day basis manage a company together, where one was like, most probably scared of me, it was like, no, 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 I don't want to hire her. And the other one, I mean, can you see, right? Can, can, can you see what we are, what an amazing kind of person we are getting here? Yeah. Exactly. I completely understand. I know someone, he is an absolutely amazing person, brilliant, uh, also dropped out of school. Uh, he invented YouTube before YouTube. Um, and obviously it wasn't the right time because it was too early for all of that to take place. Uh, but then he, he, he has the same struggle because he is ADHD as well. And people don't know how to deal with divergence. People don't know how to deal with people who don't look like them, talk like them, behave like them, breathe like them, and so on and so forth. And that creates problem, a problem because you cannot actu activate the process of change. You cannot activate the process of growth if you keep enacting the same processes, the same pathways, the same thoughts, the same systems over and over again. It takes someone from the outside to see things with, with a critical eye, change things, to disrupt things, and it takes a lot of energy to do that. And in that sense, that is a considerable advantage. Um, but not not many people see that see it that way. And yeah. unfortunately, the corporate sector is kind of still a bit constrained in that sense. It's because it's they don't know how to deal with with this difference, with this divergence, even when it's bringing so much richness. But perhaps it's also a lack of awareness on how much richness it can bring forth. But and, this that, is, these are costs. and this is actually a really common problem here in, in Finland, is anything that is out of uniform, out of the expectation, is generally just pushed aside and ignored. And one of the things that we've been finding, especially in, in interchange, in our discussions, We've been finding a commonality, a connection between um, polymaths, folks who are just embracing a million different ways of thinking and working and connecting the dots, and neurodivergence. People who mm. didn't really necessarily fit in the first place. And I myself, as, as I've gone through a similar sort of realization in recent effectively the last year, that all of these things that I'm doing, I'm finding them written out as, as coping mechanisms that people with ADD and ADHD use to just get through daily life. And I just thought they were things I did. I thought they were quirks, character things, or what have you. And they're, you know, they're things that people use to deal with, for example, executive dysfunction, which it just always sounded scary, so I never associated it with myself. But because of it, I've been approaching my life very differently than a lot of people. And I think that this is a really common trait in these, these polymaths, these, um, again, angels of chaos. I love that. I love that phrasing. And oh, I, I, 
I mean, trust me, right? You use that in the introduction of me, and people will later, or everyone who is listening, right, will see me how broad my smile was when you said that, right? right. Uh, and you know, just like we know, and I, and it's beautiful. I mean, that's it. It really is, and I mean, because right when my 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 journey of kind of my coming out as an ADHD, right, really publicly talking about it is also a really long story. And right in, in a recent interview I gave, right, which can be found in YouTube, I, I talk about that one in, in, uh, in quite extended length, is that um, because, right, I mean, when I travel back into time as a, as a toddler or as a baby, right, that is far, I, my, my trip there is a bit longer than yours, Paul, and I assume a bit longer than yours, Alexandra. So, um, and I think back at that time, right, something like ADHD was not really a kind of recognized kind of condition. Right, mm -hmm. even though I, I try to read a book, but I always get uh, right uh, diverted. So where they say that even back in time, right, most amazing people, right, inventors, artists, nowadays they are considered as ADHD themselves, right? And so that they more say, right, when the industrial revolution happened and work was more standardized, right? that this really, really kind of made it more and more difficult for those creative, out of the box, very different people to just fit in, which yeah. ended up making it a real kind of, in the medical books kind of condition. But so um, I, and um, on top of that, um, or let's say, so in my, my kind of looking back, I seem considered myself a very angry child. Right, I see myself more or less sitting on the dinner table, on the dinner table, not at the dinner table. Right, <laughs> right. I remember later in the house in my my parents' house where I was uh, grew up until I went to a private school. Right, at some point I moved into a large kind of hobby room which had also the the kind of heating system. So the heating system for the house and my kind of room was the same room. As a consequence, the door was metal. So in case there would be a fire, right, it would not immediately go into the rest of the house. So trust me, if I was angry, I would slam that door and the whole house would shake. Because if you are angry and right, I usually say I, I think I'm really the daughter of my father because He's also quite strong, right? I'm a lion's daughter. So, um, and by the way, side note, he's the best hugger. He even broke someone a rib while hugging. And I will, there's one person here in Helsinki. Yes, exactly. And one person here in Helsinki who I haven't seen in a while, right? She at one point, she said, right, I'm giving the best hugs because I really, right, I really uh, hug you deeply. And I told you, but you, come on, you have kids, you have a husband. And she was like, yeah, yeah, no, but that's their job, right? I want a proper hug from the chocolate angel. Mm. And, and trying now to, to get back to my thought, but uh, so um, I, right, I considered myself as a really angry, upset child, right? I was Right, I was so angry. Uh, my, I, I wanted to go on a private school. Right, I was not happy at home anymore. But um, people, for example, my my godmother, right, one day, a, year, a couple of years back, when I talked with her about it, and she was like, "No, you were the most happiest baby I've ever seen in my life." And I'm like, "How is that possible?" Right, my, my oldest friend said, no, 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 we were not eating all those candies by yourself when you were, when we met. You were always the one who gave the chocolates away, uh, the, the candies away to everyone. I'm like, no, I didn't. Yes, you did. <laughs> so, I mean, I really, I, and, and so um, for pretty much my whole life, somewhere in the back of my mind, right, I thought, 
ADHD might be a case, and that is also and right. I verified it with my mom. I am openly talking about her role as well as the role of my younger brother, who was diagnosed with ADHD, and that was then when I was a, a teenager, right? And at that time, my mom would one day come back from a therapy uh, kind of session, whatever. And she said in a side sentence, she was like, oh, today I learned, right, all the problems with you might be related to you being in ADHD. And that was that one side sentence. And then we never spoke about it in my whole life. So, and an interesting element on that one is that, right, I pretty much never spoke with anyone about it. No one knew about it. I pretty much had to find, or let's say, I also never got medication or a diagnosis. Mm. So I never had ever a moment where I would just, I focus. No, I had to find throughout my whole life, constant coping mechanisms to not just run against the wall. Or, you know, and I'm super happy. I never ever in my life tried drugs, right? Whether, you know, someone just has a bag with all kind of medications, like, hey, everyone, right, take a piece or really going down, trying any type of drug, because I personally, and I know whom to thank for, because there was one person who once said, right, not you. And uh, because honestly, and I think I'm, yeah, I'm, I am honestly anyway all the time, right? I don't think I would be alive by now if I would have ever gotten my hand once on a drug. Because I think, right, if that is then your mechanism to deal with your blown brain, right, I most probably would have been already dead by now. You realize the, the sort of slippery slope that that would have been for you personally? Yes. Yeah. So with those really sort of different experiences that help create these polymaths, there, there is sort of this commonality in, in struggle that I think... Not, not everybody, not, not everybody who thinks and works differently has run into it. But I think that a lot of people who have, have difficulty with these things. And I know myself, mm -hmm. um, I'd like to dig into your advice. Um, see, yes. for those neuro, neurodiverse folks out there, for those polymaths, for those people who are just, you know, for whatever reason, looking at things a little bit differently. How would you advise them? What's the best way to sort of bring out this, this compassion, this inner, inner happiness, this, this outreach beyond oneself? Because I feel like once, once we start stretching past ourselves and caring about other people, then mm -hmm. we're sort of more fulfilled ourselves as well. But, but how, yeah. what is it that you would, you would focus on as advice for these folks? I mean, let, let's say, um, especially when on the ADHD, because I don't know if every kind of range of being different, right, has that. But I, one of the eye opener for me was really there are beautiful kind of side effects, right? You, you are quite empathic if you have that condition, right? For example, uh, right, one of the positive side effects is having a huge sense of justice. For example, if someone is treated, right, um, unjust. I can really immediately jump from I'm super happy to what the right and thump my right, put my uh, thumb on the table, right? And also, uh, kind of, at least for me, for example, people are sometimes surprised if I say, right, I might connect millions of people all constantly on in different levels, but I'm really not good in meeting a lot of people, right? In, in for example, I was never in a, in a so called peak. Right, your, your friends kind of circle or right when when people tell me oh Verena we right I invite you to my party and I'm like because the moment right I'm surrounded by several people right and then I, I write every every time I meet someone that's super intense right because I'm I'm all about kind of you and I'm focused on you so kind of focusing them really only one person at the time right because that also, uh, at least for me, I think 
in, in this level where you bring several people together in a click, right? You, you were friends from school or whatever. There's a lot of judging, right? It might be like, oh, right. Oh, yeah. He was my boyfriend in the purse and mine as well. But so be careful, right? When you will be the next one on his list, right? So there, there's a lot of kind of social interaction, right? And perhaps not always something which necessarily kind of lift you up. Right, but if so, I I'm really excelling and happy to meet people individually. Right, then my phone is off or somewhere else, and I'm all yours. And as a chocolate angel, I can really pretty much break that. Then, if I, for example, I claim I can make 200 people in an hour happy, right? Because I really kind of put the focus on you, right, for a few seconds. And then my focus goes on the next person. So in a way, that is my coping mechanism, for example, to deal with working at a conference with 500 people, right? By really kind of focusing on one person at a time and not trying to get into these kind of... I don't know, family dynamics and, and you, you know, your mom tells you, oh, your cousin just lost weight. Don't you want to lose weight as well? No, just because my cousin want to lose weight. I'm not ready for that. <laughs> if, you know, the dance. <laughs> Seems like a big commitment, man. That's, that's good for my cousin. <laughs> exactly. But I, I mean, it, it because, um, I mean, because people are sometimes really confused, right? Because they say like, but Verena, you, you connect, right? I mean, right, I'm the crazy one who, who connected thousands and thousands of ex knockins right, in the world, but that all happened in the virtual world, right? And, yeah. and so to, to a certain degree, right, um, Surprise or not surprisingly, right? I mean, I'm, I'm living here, right, in Helsinki. Paul, you haven't had the chance to visit me here, but you are whenever, right? We, let's, let's do that, right? You should sit, get there a seat on the opposite of my large, crazy working table. Um, I, I live alone here. I'm, I'm in a rather chaotic kind of environment, uh, which I'm not showing you now, but I think you might... Let's say my, my outer world around in these perimeters of my apartment, right, is as crazy as my inner brain, right? And so, because at some point I was, I realized pretty much every time I go out, I am the person who interacts with everyone. I remember everything, I recognize everyone, right? I would walk around the street and someone was like, hey, chocolate angel! All right, or I, I spot in the bus ride my, my dentist, right? I mean, I, I spot everyone who I haven't even met in, in five, 10 years, right? So I really then also make a clear distinction where I'm pretty much home. I close my door and that is my kind of place. Mm. I might be still interacting with 100 people online, but that I really learned to really kind of write uh, one friend, she's always like, when she sent me a WhatsApp message, it's almost like a letter, right? I might just send you a smile, right? Or I just, as I said, uh, right, I might send, you know, positive energy to 30 people every morning, right? Just with a combination of, you know, this emoji and that emoji and the hearts and all of that every single morning. Um, so I really kind of value very much my alone time. And also very much value. So, for example, if Paul would, would you know, send me a message, say, Verena, right, can we please meet? I want to talk. I'm happy to give you the time. And I'm happy to, write. we talk, we, we exchange ideas whatsoever. But then, right, I use my headset, right, I go home, and then it's kind of, there's no physical interaction with anyone because that's always super intense for me. I, I love it, but it's it's something I need to also kind of protect myself from at the same time. That makes sense. That's and very by the way, just yeah, just for the fun fact, right? So Ah, oh, fantastic. <laughs> right. Yeah, so, and that you draw a connection that is very important between um being different, being neurodivergent on one hand, and taking care of one's mental health, and 
the the latter is something that everybody needs to take care of, especially in a world that is increasingly chaotic, uh, yes. with with entropy being uh, act, super active in the past year and a half to two years. Yes. Um, so we can sense all of these huge changes that are happening around us. And it's a good reminder. It's a bad and good reminder of how important it is to, to take care of one's own mental health and energy and energy supply and so on and so forth. Yes. So perhaps what I would love to hear from you is another series of dot connections, this time not in time, but with themes or thematics with polymathy being one dot and being interested in so many different things and being active on so many different levels, be it IT or business or what, 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 what else? Um, neurodivergence ADHD, so the second dot. Yes. The third dot is your identity and authenticity. So who you are as a person, how you identify yourself and express yourself. Yes. And the last yeah. dot, which is mental health. If you can somehow, I know my question is very weird, <laughs> but then again, that's what we do at Interchange. But if you can somehow connect these dots for us, based on your experience, that would be amazing. I mean, um, <laughs> let, let me see. Um, I mean, Take your time. yeah, yeah, no, I, <laughs> I know I can absolutely connect the dots. Because, right, I mean, that's really where I then, in a way, right, when, when I stepped out of the corporate world, right, that is then when I really started to kind of, um, you know, reflect on many things and, and really kind of understanding and kind of, you know, putting it all together, really. Um, and be, because... Right, uh, even just just understanding kind of the the outer perspective of other people, and your inner perspective. And uh, right, I mean, when I, I went through surveys like 360 survey, you know, where where you know, for in a company, right, someone would send you many questions to and send it to others, so that 360 degree around you, people would kind of value you or kind of tell you, okay, you're good in this, you're bad in that, right? I was always the one who uh, valued myself the worst, right? My manager were the next layer, they valued me higher and my, every colleague worked with me, valued me up there, right? And uh, so, uh, and by the way, I mean, fun fact, right? I, I learned then that I, my rating was in the highest, I think, 5% across all Nokia employees ever where that was done in the whole of the history of doing that in Nokia, right? Foster where... syndrome. Absolutely, absolutely. But, uh, right, I myself never saw it. I always thought I'm really bad. I'm really not good in anything. And that, by the way, is if I connect it with a piece that um, right, I spoke earlier about the that ADHD was in the 60s, 70s, perhaps not really recognized. Only about three years ago was it recognized that, for example, for girls, it's a com it, very, very different symptoms than for boys, which was for me a complete blown. I was like, oh, because for girls, it's specifically right, this word, word kind of. Um, diarrhea, right? I just kind of blah, 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 blah. But it's also this that um, huge kind of, um, how would you say, my, my self esteem is pretty much or is so low, you would have no idea. People who meet me, they are always like, Verena, you don't bullshit me. It can't be that I see you and you see yourself so on the other level of the spectrum, right? But putting that all together and then really through those years understanding myself, right? I, for example, also when I started, uh, this, uh, when I did the decision to start my own business, my oldest and best friend, right, um, studied, she's very much in studying and she studied the science of happiness, which is a Stanford uh, course, right? It's still offered, it's currently running, right? It's um, and that course was such an eye-opener for me because everything I learned there was like, oh, I'm doing that already. 
oh, oh my goodness, I'm doing that already. You don't need to tell me that. That's how I'm living. That's how I lived all the time. So it was a huge thing for me when I realized I was always happy at work. Everything they tried to teach me there, I did that naturally over the time. So that really started to give me, in a way, a peace of mind to understand who I am, right? And I remember when someone kind of heard my story and he used to work, right, for Microsoft here in Finland, and then he was like, oh, so if you weren't workaholic, so, but, so are you telling me, right, to be happy, you have to be a workaholic? I was like, no, 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 no. I just was so happy and I was so kind of, you know, value adding. So I just couldn't stop working because as long as I can add value, right? I, I just, right, people would pretty much drag me out of the office. And, and someone who, uh, again, I don't think she wanted to harm me, but long, long time back in Nokia, someone was like, oh, Verena, right? You realize Nokia is, you don't own Nokia, right? And I'm like, oh, really? Oh, you mean, Good that you told me that. I had no idea. Right? I, I had no idea that I'm not bringing all that money home, right? I love the sarcasm. <laughs> <laughs> because, right, it, it, so it, it's really from, from kind of, in a way, really years long struggle, right? Because I, I, I often say, right, I mean, you will always see the with my headset and, and kind of a bag which I put over my shoulder, right, and everything I need in a way, right, to, to get through my day is in that bag, right? It's not yeah. a handbag, right, but it's kind of right over the shoulder and then it's there, right? And for example, if something is not there, or right, or even if my, don't ask me, right, if, if this pen, it's a very high quality, right, pencil, right, very heavy, right, if that would be suddenly lost, I, I would go in a panic attack, right, I would run through all the Nokia meeting rooms, I was like, where's my, where's my, I need my pencil, right, so I mean, inside, there was so much struggle, right, and the whole outside would see me like, oh, amazing, she can, wow, balance, right, million of things at the same time, right, so it's, it's really kind of getting there piece by piece, right, how can you travel constantly, right, or quite often around the world if you don't have a mechanism to have your basics always somewhere on you, right? Because otherwise you might immediately was like, and I and I then even go back and say like, what the, so start to punish myself, not really punish myself, but talk negatively about myself I was like how in hell can you not even keep a single thought between two meters there and two meters there right how do I constantly need to go back and forth or right how, how can you not take care of your car or your apartment right how can you let it be so kind of loose on any level yeah. and I have to say that um, moving away from my own society right, Germany, going somewhere where really, even though far more people know me in Finland than they know me in Germany, to be honest, right, due to things I did around Nokia, right, um, far more people know me in Finland or other parts in the world than and knowing me in Germany, right, but really putting my, my, um, own kind, or I, I usually say that there's still this little voice in the back of our mind, right? And even though perhaps no one ever tells us certain things, how we should behave, right? But that voice is in the back of our mind there, right? I'm a woman, so come on, how can you not become a mother, right? Build a family, right? I hate the heat. Right, everyone else in summer, you right? I want to go out, right? I want to enjoy the heat. I'm like, I really don't, right? I don't like vacation, right? After two weeks, I don't even like weekends not to work, right? Nowadays, I work seven and a half hours every day uh, in the week for the corporate job, and every other hour I do left, right, connect people whatsoever. On a Friday afternoon in my old world, right, I was like, oh no, it's Friday, right, I still wanted to do this and that and that. 
And then usually I put myself in a closet, right? On Monday morning, yeah, I can be productive again. <laughs> so <laughs> it's breaking all and, stereotypes, right? All of them. <laughs> I mean, it, it's because, um, right? I mean, how, right? How can you, for example, wake up at four o'clock in the morning, right? Um, how can you not right, enjoy the life outside of work? Come on, right? I mean, most people think, oh, I do work because I want to enjoy my life outside of work. Right? For me, the fun in my life was the work bit, not the part outside. Right? Mm -hmm. and, and, um, and, and for example, the, um, when I moved here, that was a big step for me to really kind of start to embrace myself. But it was still, I mean, um, for, because of different reasons, what happened in Nokia, right, organizational changes, a lot going on. Work became really a bigger burden for me than it was before. But my life became far more balanced here. Interesting, for example, I was my whole life heavily under hay fever. So, I mean, pretty much from March to September, sneezing, so that your whole body just goes like <gasps> 10 times exactly. Um, my, one of my key trigger for allergy are birch trees. And Paul, I'm sure you know there are millions of birch trees around me here in Finland. This is Finland is all birch trees. It's... Ever since I moved to Finland, my allergy is pretty much gone. Mm. And what I at least recently, and whether it's true or not, but at least right, science says uh, ADHD because it means pretty much you have no filter. Everything was completely recently kind of right. So, and what they say is because right, it's as a baby, right? So that as a baby, your body is not really good in building kind of um, what is it? immune system because of constantly exposed. And so because I think at least in my memory since age five, right, I'm heavily kind of impacted from hay fever, right? So that was part of impacting my whole life, right? In summer, everyone has fun outside. For me, dark room, wet towel on my face because my eyes would, you know, just go into a small slit, right? Um, and they say that if you balance your life out, right, mental everything, right, then, right, also your, your allergies can go away. So that, because in the, in the first years, I would kind of refer that to the very fresh air we have here. But here I can really kind of go into the nature for hours without sneezing once and without medication. I mean, this year it's really heavy, so even I have to take once in a while but one pill in the morning and I'm fine, right? But, um, and there was still something, um, yeah, about the, the, right, waking up at four o'clock. And that obviously also means that I will not be awake at 11 o'clock in the evening. And I might not be, I mean, I can also meet people in the evening, but then I really need to, in a way, meet them relatively early because as long as I meet you and talk with you, I'm energized, I can stay awake until 11 o'clock, but I need them to have that interaction with other people. And an interesting thing, um, the other day, right, a very dear colleague at my day job, right, uh, what I call my, my work as deployment manager, where my salary is currently coming from, she, uh, right, she, she shared a um, podcast um, with me where she said, hey, right, that is about good money. And the guy who is intervo was interviewed is, has ADHD as well. And she recommended it to me. And I listened to it uh, earlier this week on one of my long walks, uh, on, on my walks to Siurasari, beautiful island in the middle of Helsinki. And I'm not sure if you have heard of him. His name is Peter Schenkman. And um, he also learned quite late in his life, I think he said there 34, that he was diagnosed with uh, ADHD. 
but he also he said he he started right uh, Alexander just like the guy you met about right who invented the early YouTube. He was full of energy. He started all kind of business, etc. And he spoke also about the fact of waking up early. And he said, right, if people ask him, how can you wake up so early? And he said, just go earlier to bed. It's as simple as that. Right? And uh, when I moved here, I had one big revelation when right, a friend who is from Nigeria living here, and he said, oh, you know, when can we talk in the evening? And I was like, ah. And on the same days, a friend from Germany, she was like, Oh, I want to talk with you and write, uh, you know, how, uh, and she was, I'm just uh, going on a run, right? So when can we talk? And, but for me, it's always an hour later, right? And I finally was able, brave enough against all the kind of society expectation, how you should behave, was finally brave enough to say, to be honest, guys, forget it, right? That is my time when I mentally I'm happy to have a call with you right at six o'clock in the morning seven eight o'clock weekend we will find a slot but don't expect from me right that I have time for you when my time is to mentally shut down yeah and this the environment in which we live in has so much so many expectations for us individually and it's even harder. Yes. So it's already hard for everybody, but it's even harder for the ones who don't share the kind of characteristics or behavior patterns as everybody else, because there's yes. kind of this gap between how you live your day and how the other person live their days. Yes. And that would apply for someone who uh, likes to work late at night up until 3, 4 a.m. in the morning and who can only wake up at 11 a.m. And, and 12 p.m., and who perhaps have made a sacrifice to record a podcast early in the morning. Um, now I'm not talking about you, Paul, not at all. Um, so <laughs> so it's, it's, it's the same because there are certain, oh, you don't wake up early in the morning? Oh, you wake up at, 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 at midday? Oh, you, you sleep at 3, 4 a.m. in the morning. Now, of course, arguably from a sleep pattern, it, it might not be very, very, very healthy if you don't, don't get enough sleep and rest and all that. But the idea yeah, of having yeah. all these expectations, uh, because we think that this is the way things are supposed to be, is it just doesn't make sense. It's not sensical. Yeah, there's an incredible strength in this just looking at oneself and being honest about one's needs. I mean, that that's actually it was a huge bonus for me um, when the corona lockdown started. Suddenly I, I wasn't obligated to wake up several hours earlier than I needed to be functional just so that I could get my head in a state where I could stand other people. Like I didn't need to do that every day. I could then, yeah. you know, effectively, you know, schedule my time, work with what worked with my brain. And then talking with other people and realizing that that you're not necessarily alone in this, that other people have had similar experiences, whether it's aligned to a different time of day or not, but yeah. that, that we aren't alone in this idea or in the imposter syndrome or in seeing oneself as the, the angry child sitting on the dinner table like I... I similarly have had conversations with my family where, you know, when I describe myself as a child, I'm always thinking of myself in terms of, you know, I was extremely quiet and I was looking at everyone judgmentally thinking like, what is wrong with that person? I wouldn't say a word because it was much more polite to just quietly stare. But there was judgment. And then everyone who talks about me as a child, oh, you were so happy and you were so these other things. And I'm like, Really? Why? Why is my memory so different? Like, and then just just having this this understanding that the outside and the inside of a person they're both valid and relevant, and that we aren't necessarily the only people who are are fighting through these incongruities, these these uh, these odd. Odd sort of. 
I mean, one, one thing, because what I noticed, and I mean, one thing which also kind of helped my transformation in those years when I then said, okay, this is a business, right? I, because, um, right, uh, I gained another kind of dear friend in those years, right? And he is a minimalist. He's an amazing person. I usually, when I describe him, I say, right, he has written uh, people in capital letters written on his soul. And um, through him, I learned a lot and I've reflected a lot. And um, yeah, and where was what <laughs> to tell that now? But um, because, um, yeah, um, what I learned through him and also kind of the reflecting on people is really that um, we, we all are individuals, right? With our struggle, with our whatever it takes. And there's easy with kind of whether you really want to hurt another person or you don't want to hurt another person, but you don't realize it. So to really accept the person as they are, mm. right? And, and because... Uh, Alexandra, what you earlier said, right, when people say like, right, how dare you not do this or how can you do not like what everyone else like, right, that every time you say that out loud to another person, you have no idea what that triggers in the brain of that person. Yeah. Right, because that really might hit them completely right and kick them completely in the wrong direction, right? Because that might play depending on the person, right? It might be a normal person, it might be a neurodiverse person, whatsoever. It might completely, you know, take them over the edge, right? Or it may play with their brain for the next 30 years. Yeah. And, and that is, right? So as always in the Interchange podcast, we like to jump into a section that we call the Rapid Seven. It's a delightful opportunity to throw a series of questions very quickly at our guest and see what kind of answers we can get, short and simple as best. Uh, ideally yes. one word, but um, let's just get started, shall we? Are, are you ready for it, Verena? Uh, <laughs> bring it on. Right? You see, that's, that's the right attitude. We'll, we'll get started right away. So, first question. Dark chocolate or white chocolate? Dark. Yes. Favorite phone? Uh, night on Earth. From Jim Jarmusch. I, I totally get it. We were actually asking favorite phone, but favorite film is good, too. <laughs> oh! <laughs> <laughs> Never heard of that phone before. Um, you gotta check it out. <laughs> got a beautiful scene with a taxi cab in Finland. It's taxi cabs everywhere, but absolutely, oh, absolutely, beautiful film. I like it. <laughs> so, um, describe the future in one word. Full of smiles. Oh, <laughs> that's more than one word, but I love it. Full of smiles. Oh. Okay, let, let's see what this is going to bring us. Describe the present in one word. Lovely, because I talk with this, uh, two of you. Oh. oh, thank you. Lovely. Okay, describe your state of mind in one word. <laughs> That's going to be challenging. <laughs> In, in the moment, because again, I talk with you. Mm. Present. Your and, and, and greatest... By the way, yeah. Yeah. Uh, extending by the one way. word, right? Um, it is an exception in a way because I talk with two persons at the same time. Usually I can be only that in a present with one person, so... I understand. Yeah. Your greatest source of joy other people oh that's congruence and 
an inspirational message in about five words. Or less. Or maybe a bit more, but not more than six or seven. <laughs> Try to make the person the person smile. Okay, that's six. We got that. We it. got that. Um, what I really love about this is the level of congruence uh, and alignment between the different answers because there's there's a single thread that goes through all of these uh, answers even the one that was meant to be a phone but ended up being a film um, <laughs> even that there's kind of this single thread which is this people human-centered way of living do you call it a lifestyle is it a lifestyle that you, that you have um Yes, I guess it is, but it took me really long time to realize that yeah. because I did not understood it. Yeah. Because, right, I mean, um, th there are moments where I sometimes think, am I kind of this social anxiety that I don't want to be around other people? That's not the case. It's just I need to really kind of separate between that incredible intense moment when I'm in the presence or interacting with other people with my absolutely alone time where I kind of balance that out. So I'm happy to on a constant basis write people. And because I remember every single person, right? I mean, whether I connect people, the element of you know, African continent startups with, you know, Olympic, uh, you know, a participant at an Olympic Games or, right, a politician with, you know, whomever or a refugee. I mean, wherever I have the ability with a few sentences or a few messages connect people, right, as long as they carry it forward. Hey, Call me in. I, I'm happy to do that across yeah, the whole world, across every level. Yeah. Uh, and there's also something very important is that, uh, be it ADHD or, or otherwise, people ask, and this is perhaps one question that, that I wanted to ask at some point, is how come you have so much energy all the time? Well, one interpretation is that, well, guess what? My brain works this way. If you're too slow, <laughs> then it's your problem, not mine. And then the second <laughs> answer is that energy, uh, human energy is such a magnificent uh, tool and source because it's renewable. It's when you, when you don't have energy anymore, there's something that you can do, something that you need to do, something that you absolutely must do that recharges you, that fuels you with more energy. And then you can spend this energy. And... I love the idea of intensity because instead of living life um, normally, not, not normally, that's not the correct term, but just average, average energy everywhere, average attention everywhere, just passing by, passing by everything and not living things with intensity, we will not be able to be as creative as we want to be. We will not be able to be as... Uh, as connected to others as we'd like to be because all of these great things take energy and take attention and take yes. intensity. Yes. And yes. by doing all of that, you're putting all that intensity, all that energy out there. And that's absolutely amazing. And then knowing how to recharge in order to do more of that is even more amazing. Yeah. And I mean, right, I learned now this is really a long time. And again, that is relatively brave to tell that to people and say, sorry, but I mean, if I close my door or... Right? Don't even bother trying to just drop by my address and ring my doorbell. I might run in a panic attack, right? But ping me and say, in five minutes, I'm there. I'm, I'm okay, right? Because then I respond and I say, okay, cool. In five minutes, I'm dressed and everything's fine, right? Um, so that is part of mine. And for example, meditation just doesn't work for me. But at the same time, I know that at least, Alexandra, you are a bit curious, right? What I did in the four hours... Oh, I'm sorry, six hours, right, before we went on yes. this call. <laughs> yes, please. 
right? <laughs> like a whole work day. Just so yeah, pretty much for, for some people, it was most probably a full work day. So I would, uh, I think this morning, right, I woke up about um, short uh, or a bit before five o'clock in the morning. And because, right, it's now really sunny and warm in Helsinki, right, about 20 degrees. So I decided already yesterday, yes, this morning, I will start my proper outdoor swimming season. So I took on, even usually I start with my breakfast preparation. I did not do that. So I took out my swimming suit, right? My, my, my boyer, my red boyer, so that no one would drive over me on the Baltic Sea because Alexander, I was swimming in the Baltic Sea. So I was swimming already half an hour in the Baltic Sea. Yes, I can see her freezing the up there. Uh, oh. And I swam about 850 meters. So, which is quite a bit of a distance for me. So, um, then I went back home. I have a certain routine. So, I, I even love to have, I, I learned again through that podcast, right? Um, that's something I had to establish for myself. I work best with really rituals. So, if everything kind of right, for example, every morning while I have breakfast, I write because I became also more by chance and more vegan, vegetarian, uh, flexitarian, whatever you call it. So I make sure I take my B12 vitamin, then I measure my body temperature because fun fact is my body temperature is extremely low compared to usual people. So it can go all the way down to 35 instead of 60, 30, uh, sorry, 35 instead of 36.5 or something like that. Then I measure my uh, blood pressure because, right, at some point the doctor thought I have high blood pressure. The fun fact is my blood pressure goes up if I meet other people. Then I'm suddenly like boom, 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 boom. My, my breakfast preparation takes about 15 to 20 minutes. It, ha it contains approximately 25 ingredients. I have three very manual processes, including I started grinding my own coffee every morning. Um, the other manual exercise is I have a manual kind of um, method to uh, you know, make uh, my milk for my you know, coffee kind of. So there's a certain kind of nice old tool where I make my own uh, kind of you know, milk foam. And the third manual method goes back to my childhood which is, I don't know, it's, it's a, a kind of piece where you make your own a kind of um, apple, what is it, um, mousse. So yeah. it, it's, it's kind of really a ritual of having a very healthy breakfast, including pomegranate seeds. And so all my health comes from my breakfast. When I eat my breakfast, I sit at my laptop, spread positive energy to 35 people, including kids, etc. Then what I do is I uh, write, I, um, for example, Alexandra already got uh, the first kind of taste of it. And I think Paul had it also uh, since he met me. So I started preparing positive messages every time LinkedIn tells me someone has a birthday or a you know, work anniversary or new job. So I have five different messages, in plus the birthday greetings in German and English, right? And then I would send them out to people. Um, what else do I do? So pretty much, right, all those kind of stuff, right? Then I made sure that I even have boxes around me in case you want to see the chocolate angel box and have the experience on this call. So I pretty much do all those things, right? I heat water because I got really in drinking hot water. So that gives you a bit of an idea what I do in my morning before I went on this call. <laughs> Do you have the box with you? Breakfast. Sorry, which who goes first? Alexandra, ladies first, right? What is your question? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, kudos for the 25 ingredients breakfast. It's not yes. a question, it's just a, a statement right. of admiration. <laughs> Respect. <laughs> It, it, it started from, from kind of trying to lose weight and then, you know, a doctor kind of verified what I do, right? And it was, 
and and then I extended it all the time, right, to include you know seeds and nuts and pomegranate and you know, so because I had a tendency to kind of or let's say right, um, if your mind is only either working or well, not working, right, then you might also want to have something which kind of keeps you occupied. Mm. So I would eat usually healthy, but I couldn't just stop eating. So I would just eat, 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 eat until my brain or my body goes like, okay, we're enough. it's enough now. And I mean, COVID, I know it, I mean, it's tough, but because I enjoy my long time while still connecting with people, even on a Zoom or a Google Meet call, right? So I very much enjoy. And I think Paul uh, had an idea, right? I think compared to how he met me first time, um, I, I lost decent amount of weight by really ritualizing my eating habit as well, to really putting things in the storage, right, in the, the fridge, right, going back to some childhood food, what I love to eat, right? And I also, I'm never bored. I can eat the same thing over and over and as long as it's healthy, right? And my doctor did a check. So even now checking uh, all my vitamins, am I missing something? Um, Paul, now it's your question. <laughs> Do you happen to have with you? Oh, I have all, those. I mean, I have all kind of boxes. Yes, absolutely. So is, let me see. So, yeah, which is your favorite? <laughs> I mean, I don't, it's not about favorite. Let's say, right, I, I told earlier, I went from, right, I would just spend money on everything, right, to being extremely resourceful, right, and reusing and wherever it's possible. So let's start with the smallest box. Live happy. Legit. This box, right? Gratitude. Um, was yes. It it had. Okay, my internet connection is now unstable. Can you still hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It was going a little um, slow for a second, but this this box was sent for me for me uh, from a friend, right? When I was already right known as the happy chocolate angel whatsoever. And there were little kind of note papers in where you can put then a gratitude, write a gratitude note. But for me, it became the perfect small box to have it in my day-to-day -day kind of bag around my shoulder, right? So if I go to the supermarket, it's always there. So let's see, currently it's a bit empty, but still, let me take the camera and move it down. So this is the current content of the box. Oh. Can you see it? Yes. A couple of good classic Finnish ones. Yes, and a very classic German one as well, because the, the, the pink one, right, or yeah. is, is a big childhood memory for Germans. So you can I can identify every German in the world who had either a childhood in memory, childhood in Germany, or grew up in Germany. So um, that is really only the day-to-day, -day, right? Whoever meets me gets to meet that box. Um, then let me see. I have another box. This Not one. it was framed. Whoever meets me get to meet that box. Oh, absolutely. So this box was sent from, uh, or brought from one of my favorite manager I earlier spoke about, right? It was full of cookies from, from Belgium and the brand, I don't even know about the brand, right? But it's a perfect box. And that is, by the way, the box in the eight second video, right? Which I will, you know, later share with you. And right, currently it's empty, but it's empty because everything what was in there before this call made it into this box. This box is very simple, white, nothing special. It has the, wait a second, let's see, can we get it to a level where you can see the, ah. Yeah, if it's in front of you, I think. Yes. It's a business card of mine. It's a very simple white box. The fun thing is I reuse all the time. So I glued my business card over the word Nokia because this is an health uh, aware watch and the brand used to belong to Nokia now. It's with things again. And so one of the earlier watches I had to watch my sleep, walk, everything was part of this box. So you still have the uh, kind of serial number here. 
Yeah. And I, I told earlier about one important element of this very early box, because right, I walk up to you, right, with a big smile and you already smile. And then without you realizing what's happening, right, there's this small movement, beep, 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 right? So it, it's kind of, right, it doesn't help if it's a box where you have two pieces, right, the bottom and the top piece. So I learned along the way as a detailed German that this movement is really important, right? Because people have no idea what hits them, right? It's a total surprise. They see a crazy person, right? Funny, uh, you know, colored shirt, right? Smile. And the next moment the box goes open. And so let's see how the box currently is filled. Or should we have a bit of an candy rain? Let's see how that works. Candy rain. It's raining gandies today. So now, I love it. <laughs> absolutely. So, um, and by the way, so it's full of childhood memories, right? It is because beside, right, when the box goes open and then people's reactions like, oh, is that for me? For, for, really, for me? Well, oh. And then people start to find their childhood memories in the box. And that is really the third kind of highest level of kind of reaction, right? The, 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 the service in a way is already delivered with just the smile, right? They haven't even seen the content of the box. The next level is seeing the box. And the third one is if suddenly they are in a memory with their grandfather who died 10 years ago, right? Yeah. Or if they are suddenly, so in a way the, this effect what I have, I need Paul, and I immediately remember, you know, the bus number 37, where he was waiting for when he last time met me. So in a way, meeting um, childhood or any kind of memory in the box brings people the same effect because they are suddenly on their wedding day. Yeah. Right. So, um, yeah. And then there are bigger box when people really book me because then obviously, right, I meet more people in a quicker time. So the box, box needs to be bigger and full of, uh, you know, colored experience. And then fun part is also, which I hear often in the, the work world, right? Because remember, I remember everything. <laughs> so I remember every reaction, right? Mm. And um at the time when I was in that corporation, which no one will figure out except the people who have met me working for that company, um, even the, the, the former CIO of that company happened to then change jobs and then he suddenly was exposed to the chocolate angel once a week. And his reaction when he saw the box, right, he was like, oh, that is such a difficult choice, right? Because I mean, I'm not sure if the, that works now with the camera, but if I try, no, I think it doesn't work. So there's now on my, on my keyboard, there are about, in that small box, there are about 50 different candies and chocolate. So when he said, oh, that is such a difficult choice. My response was, if, or if, sorry, um, no, let me tell the story correct. He said, that is a very difficult decision. And I said, if that is your most difficult decision today, then it is a good day. Smart. I, I might be quick with my tongue and that helps as well. <laughs> <laughs> but that perspective, that's, that's incredibly valuable for people. Just to be able to, again, I'd mentioned early separating myself from the equation. I think this is something that a lot of people don't necessarily do on a regular basis. They don't necessarily take a second to pull back from their daily life and breathe and just enjoy something small, like a piece of chocolate. Even when they have a piece of chocolate, maybe it came with their coffee and it's right there, but they don't, they don't focus on it. They don't enjoy it the same way they do if it's presented by someone else. If every piece of chocolate in that box is unique and they have to choose, and then, then suddenly they're focused on the sensation, the flavor, the, the, the feel, all of it becomes so much more in, incredibly tangible for them. And I think the same way that... 
that's quite yeah. meditative. Right. And then maybe you're not good at meditation, but this is a different form of meditation, of focusing yourself on a moment. And yeah. And I think that that's an incredibly powerful thing to, to have designed and shaped that moment right down to the opening of the lid. You want it to always have a hinge. You want it to always be just right. You've, you've picked and chosen boxes for different occasions. This is, this is a way of asserting, asserting your willpower on a tiny little area around yourself and then spreading it to someone else. Just for a moment. The, the point is, right, because um, it's not that uh, an ADHD person has, is never be able to focus, but if they focus, right, then they might focus and doing things which are completely useless or doesn't bring any value for 10 hours because you are so passionate about it, yeah. right? So it's really, you are, and, and the, the, the husband of my oldest friend, he once said so lovely, he said, I'm living in extremes. I don't know how to live in a middle ground. Either I do extremely the one side or I go into the other extreme. I don't even know how to live just, you know, Alexander, what you earlier said, right? Perhaps you should not kind of dare to, to just live every day, just, you know, the way and all, and then comes the vacation, right? And if suddenly, right, COVID hits and we are not able to go on that one, two weeks vacation, what the whole year we were waiting for that day, right? Finally, all the other one. No, let's try to find those beautiful small things in our day-to-day -day interaction, right? Let's not, let's see what, what positive things you can establish within your work. And, and uh, right, I earlier, or we, um, for example, right, if, if people kind of, you know, are interested and kind of look around and recently someone who have met me the last time when we were perhaps 18 or 19 years old, no, sorry, I think in a private school, right, we recently reconnected, uh, right, not just by connecting in social media, but really kind of reconnecting with a message. And she, she told me she has read about me in a book and she was completely blown away. And I'm like, uh, I know only of one book which talks about me. So, I mean, are there other books who are talking about me and I just don't know about it? But uh, that book where I, part of my story is uh, kind of told is really a beautiful book. And for people living in Finland, right? Or around Helsinki Espoo, I can tell you a secret. You can even find it in the library here because I encourage the library in Espoo to buy a copy of the book so that people can find it and borrow it because the book is called Do Good at Work. And that exactly really speaks about beautiful examples down to scientific uh, kind of expertise on why it is so important to have a purpose at work, right? And the author calls me pretty much the role model or the poster child for do good at work, right? Where you can, there are so many things, tiny things where you can really find in the most mundane jobs, a real purpose, right? And that will, that, that can, everyone can do, right? Find something right in the tiny things and trust me, it's not that other people don't value that, right? It's just right, embrace your own being a bit different or coming up with a funny idea or coming up with something as long as it's not harmful to anyone else, right? Everyone will highly appreciate that. They might not always show it on the first glance, but they do, they do. <laughs> I think that is a wonderful thought uh, and I would love for our audience to kind of ponder on those last few words when it comes to those little moments that we can find in the most mundane structures. Uh, and I think by tapping a bit more into that, we can tap a bit more into, as you said, Verena, at the beginning, our inner child. Uh, and lead a more fulfilling, more aligned kind of life. Um, Verena, I want to thank you wholeheartedly for this 
for these, not micro, these were macro moments of joy and human connection and insights and uh, authentic selflessness. So I want to thank you so much for everything. And I want to thank our audience for listening to us. Verena, a few last words perhaps that you would like to add? I mean, what, the recommendation I tell to my, my dear Kati, the, the dearest child in my life, I told her, please never, you know, lose your inner child. So I would call out on every, it doesn't matter how old you are, you're able to tap into your inner child. Remember how it was, right, when you were a child and never, ever lose track of it. Fantastic advice. That <laughs> Everyone, uh, a huge, fun, enjoyable moment uh, we had now. Uh, thank you so much for uh, tuning in. Thank you, Verena, for being there. Paul, it's always a pleasure host co-hosting this with you. Um, see you again next time with another angel of chaos. <laughs> Bye, everybody. My pleasure. Bye-bye.